So uh, back for chapter 13. Uh, chapter 13 is dealing with the piano. And for the most part, they're talking about the grand piano in the lecture notes. Um, I'm also including some resources for upright pianos, which are uh, for the most part the same. So the first three videos that will be on the, on the page uh, after my lecture, one is a uh, Steinway tour. So it's showing the construction of the grand piano. They also walk through a lot of the, the uh, uh, not just the construction, but the tuning and, and uh, the, the action and, and all that stuff. So it's a good, good place to start. Um, then I've got one that is dealing with upright pianos to a, a not quite as extensive a degree, um, which for the most part, there's really only one major, major difference when we're comparing a grand piano to an upright piano, and that is the pedal functions, uh, which I'll, I'll hit on a little bit, um, which the real conundrum with upright pianos is not every upright piano is going to follow the same pedal function. So um, there's, a, there's a video talking about the pedals on upright pianos, which may have a little bit more than I can add to that. Um, there's also a video on the historical development of keyboard instruments, which I think is pretty interesting. It's not super relevant in terms of uh, the homework. But it goes from uh, it shows the development of the keyboard instruments from originally a uh, fretted clavichord, which was like a small kind of portable keyboard instrument that you would use in a small room, to the early 1800s pianos, which are starting. Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped the harpsichord. Then to the harpsichord, it shows how they function to a early piano, which is very similar to the modern piano, but it lacks the big cast iron plate um, that a modern grand piano does. So there were fewer strings and the uh, actual wooden case did all the, uh, all the work in supporting all the string tension. So it's a, a much different sounding instrument. And it's interesting to hear how differently, um, especially the dynamic range is expressed uh, between those two instruments. Because a modern grand piano sounds pretty much the same when it's quiet or loud in terms of tone, if you're playing the same thing with the same pedal configuration and everything. Uh, but those, uh, those early, earlier pianos, uh, their tone will change as you go from uh, like a really quiet note to a really heavy note. Like the, there's actually a tone change as well, which makes them a little bit more uh, interesting instrument wise. But uh, there are reasons why the modern piano kind of came into favor and it is where we are now. Um, and then the last video on the page will be about stretch tuning, which I will probably talk about a little bit as I go through it. Stretch tuning is essentially um, how we deal with the inharmonicities that are present because of the strings in the piano. And what's going on is if you're playing a C at the bottom end of the piano and you want it to be in unison with a C at the top end of the piano, you want the whatever harmonic it's going to be, let's say the eighth harmonic of your low piano string to be playing the exact same frequency as, uh, say, the fundamental of your, uh, your high note. But the issue is that when you are dealing with strings, they only have so much flexibility, especially those low strings, which are fairly thick and stiff. Um, and so effectively what happens is the nodes will occupy, uh, the nodes of the standing wave will occupy a certain amount of space. And to compensate for that, or 
sorry, to compensate for the fact that that makes the string effectively shorter, which in effectively pitches up those higher harmonics. Um, what you end up doing is you actually tune the low notes down slightly and the high notes up slightly so that your, uh, your harmonics and fundamentals as you go up the keyboard uh, end up in unison. Because if they're out of unison, it sounds really weird. And so that's stretch tuning. And there's a video on that in there uh, as well. So I'll go ahead and get into this. This is another pretty short uh, lecture slide-wise. But uh, there's a, it's not going to be as long as the last one. But I know a fair amount about what's going on here, at least in terms of uh, the mechanism of producing sound. I'm not an expert in the action of the pianos, which is uh, fairly complicated, which is why I provided a couple of links to Sims so you can see those mechanisms in action. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the, the mechanisms, um, but I'm just gonna talk about the very uh, basic operation. I'm not gonna be able to describe every little piece and how it's gonna move down the line. Uh, we're just going to talk about, in general, what happens when you press the key um, and, and how it produces sound out of that. So when we talk about the physics of the piano, um, we have several things that come into play. We have the hammer action, which is actually providing the impulse that causes the strings to vibrate. Uh, the soundboard and how the string vibrations are coupled to the soundboard so they actually resonate and, and uh, produce sound. And then the fact that there are multiple strings. Um, we'll see that as we get into this, most, most of the keys on the piano have three strings associated with them. Some of the very low notes might only have two. And there's a reason that they do this in a piano. And it's essentially to increase the sustain and also to allow you to kind of do some different things with one of the pedals. So in a grand piano, what happens when you press the key down over, over here? So you press down on this, that's going to lever up uh, something over here, which with all these mechanisms, essentially the, the net result of when you press the key is it throws the hammer physically at the string. The damper comes up at the same time so that the string, as long as the key is depressed, uh, the damper is off the string and the string will vibrate freely. And then the back check is present just so that um, if you hit the key very hard, once the hammer bounces back off the string, it's caught by the back check so that it doesn't double hit the string. Um, I can't tell you what every little piece of this does, uh, but the, the big thing is the key, this is not lifted gently by the key. All this mechanism is so that this is actually physically thrown at the key. The harder you press it, the harder the hammer is thrown. Uh, at the uh, at the string, and this is made of felt so that it even though um, you can throw this fa fairly violently, the felt is soft enough that it's not like you're playing with a rubber mallet or anything like that. There's still enough, some give in the hammer head, even though it is uh, it is fairly stiff. Um, material wise, but they can tease it out so that you get a little bit more softness in it. And in fact, uh, they do that when they are setting the piano up at the factory, they, they actually will tease the hammer some with needles so that it has enough give uh, for what they're looking for. So ultimately, you press the key down, that lifts the damper, it throws the hammer against the string, and it bounces back and it's caught by the back check so that it doesn't double hit the string. Um, again, the rest of this we're not going to get into. That's really all you need to know. 
Um, though, if you want to watch the simulation videos to see how that action works, um, by all means, take the time so you can see it. Uh, when we're talking about an upright piano, this is not going to be very different, except instead of lying horizontally, it will lie vertically. Um, there's some minor differences in the mechanism because we're not going to be able to directly lever this up with this being horizontal and this being horizontal. It's a lot more of a direct mechanism. Um, you have to have some extra coupling when you're dealing with an upright because your keys are horizontal, but your mechanism is vertical. But once you get into it, it's the same idea. You press the key down. Uh, if we're dealing with, a, with an upright, you would press the key down and your string would be vertical. I lost my, lost my pointer. String would be vertical, but the hammer is thrown at that string in a similar way. Uh, overall, same idea. It's just a little bit more complicated because of your keyboard still being horizontal and your mechanism being vertical. So when we have the hammer thrown at the string, um, we impart a large, relatively large force in a short time window. Um, if we are applying this over a shorter time, the force is larger. That means you're import, imparting more energy to the string and you get a louder sound out as a result. Um, and so the shorter time interval just comes from how forcefully you press down the key. If you barely press it down, it's going to be thrown at the string fairly slowly, which means that collision is going to take place over a longer time interval and you get a smaller force, which means a softer sound. But if you press down really hard, it's thrown at it quickly. Short time interval for the collision means large F and it means a louder sound. Um, so for a grand piano, going from pianissimo to fortissimo, uh, you have a hammer velocity change by a factor of 100. Um, and the hammer contact time drops from about four milliseconds to about two milliseconds. So coupled, um, we're not going to get into figuring out all the energy transfer here, but this factor of 100 means the kinetic energy is uh, is basically double this, or sorry, not double this, this number squared larger. So the energy of the hammer goes from some number to 10,000 times that number. And at the same time, you're also decreasing the time interval by a factor of two, which is why the very softest sound and the very loudest sound that you get out of a grand piano are it's a pretty large dynamic range and in fact in the uh in the video with the historical keyboards he dim the player demonstrates that quite a bit how big of a dynamic range a modern grand piano has versus the earlier uh instruments and it's just kind of it comes with the uh, improvement might not be the right word, but the development of, of the grand piano as we have it now, where you have that big cast iron frame in there supporting the string tension, which means you can put the strings under more tension. You can put more strings in. Um, and all of this gives you the ability to make much long, louder sounds since you've got more strings vibrating, you're going to, you're going to put more energy in. Um, and there's also the effect of an increased sustain to the note, which we'll get into shortly. So to get the string vibrations to actually resonate well, uh, much like when we dealt with the violin, if you've, You've probably at some time taken a rubber band and stretched it out and plucked it. Uh, a vibrating string without some something to do the resonating is going to similarly not move a lot of air and thus not make a lot of sound. So if we didn't have 
this string coupled to the soundboard and the piano, hitting the hammer and having the string vibrate isn't going to do a whole heck of a lot. Um, how we actually get the sound effectively to the key, to the uh, soundboard is by running that string over the bridge, and the bridge is fixed directly to the soundboard. So once this string is vibrating against the bridge, it's pushing up and down on the soundboard and making this whole flexible soundboard vibrate up and down. Now once that big surface area of the soundboard is vibrating up and down, it moves a lot of air, um, and that means it's going to be able to make audible sounds, and in fact, fairly loud audible sounds when you really lay into the uh, when you really lay into the key. Um, you can see that the uh, if you watch the Steinway video, the bridge position is kind of it seems like it's somewhat arbitrary, but they have chosen it so that. Uh, all the strings can impart energy well to the soundboard and the soundboard is going to vibrate well at those frequencies so that you actually um, can get a loud sound out of those very high keys and the very low keys as well even though uh, especially the low notes we don't hear those as well and to get it the soundboard moving enough air for us to really be able to effectively hear them um, you've got to be able to make sure that that's coupled really well. So when we're dealing with the pitch of the piano strings, um, one thing that we have in a modern grand piano is that all the strings are at about the same tension. That's so that you don't have excess stress on one part of the cast iron frame in the, in the uh, grand piano under more stress than the other. Um, so if we have all the strings at the same tension, the really high strings and the really low strings all at the same tension, that means we have to play with either the linear mass density or the length to get different notes. And in fact, in a modern grand piano, they play with both. Um, the very highest notes are much shorter strings than the lowest notes. Um, you'll notice that when you if you watch the uh, Steinway video, the long strings actually kind of lay a little bit horizontal, and that's why the uh, wood frame of a grand piano has the shape that it does to accommodate those really long low strings, whereas the high strings are in that very kind of compact region at the at the far right end of the keyboard. Um, the length alone is not enough to accommodate the fact that we have 88 keys, which is what, um, seven-ish octaves. So we have to go through a quite a big frequency range. And you can't just do that with length, because if we're talking the very long string is, say, four times longer than the, lo the shortest string, that's not enough to get uh, seven octaves is, uh, shoot, that's like um, 128 times frequency, I think, uh, which means, let's see, that is, yeah, it's 128. So. If you were to go from C at the low end to C at the high end, you have to multiply the frequency at the low end by 128. But if you only change the length by a factor of four, that's not enough to get that 128 times difference. Clearly, you're talking about four times difference. Um, so we have to also adjust the linear mass density. And so a lot of the higher mid-range to high-end high strings are all pretty much the same piano wire, uh, just laid out at different lengths. But as you start getting to in the lower mid-range to the bottom end of the piano, you really have to play with the linear mass density then. And they do that by winding it with, uh, I think it's silver, but it might be some other wire material. Uh, to increase the linear mass density of those low strings so that you pull the frequency down low enough for where they're supposed to be. 
Um, also, this is a good point to re remember about the inharmonicities, especially those low strings, which are wound, are going to be much stiffer than the high strings. And so you have to pitch those down to make sure that all the harmonics remain in unison. The high strings have to be pitched up to accommodate, uh, to make sure that the harmonics from the mid range and the high end line up well. So the piano frame is under very high tension from the strings. Uh, this means that there is a lot of stored energy in the vibration, which gives it that huge dynamic range, taking the pianissimo to the very loud fortissimo sounds. Um, that gives you the ability to play very quiet notes and very loud notes when you really hammer on the keys. Uh, there are over 200 strings for the 88 notes each at about 200 pounds of tension, which means roughly 20 tons of tension on that entire frame. And that's why they've gone to a cast iron frame in a modern piano rather than try to do it all with wood because um, the wood would probably not hold up very well under that much tension. Um, you'll notice that it says over 200 strings for 88 notes. That means you're looking at two to three strings for each particular note. So when we deal with an ideal zero radius string, which never exists in the real world, there's always some finite thickness to the string. Uh, we have our fundamental F1. The higher harmonics are going to just be integer multiples. So if I'm looking at the third harmonic of a 100 hertz string, it's 300 hertz. But in the real world, uh, real strings with a finite radius, they vibrate at harmonics that are slightly stretched. And this is what we're running into where the nodes in those harmonics actually physically occupy a certain amount of distance because they can only bend so much. And so the string gets effectively shorter. It might decrease by, let's say, 5%, just making up a number. This is not really how much it decreases by. Um, so if, you're, if you take your length from one meter to 95 centimeters, that means you're going to pitch the frequency up by roughly 5% as well. Um, and so as you start making, uh, <clears throat> going to higher and higher harmonics, the nodes are occupying more and more of the string, which means your, your, uh, your harmonics pitch up more and more. Uh, this is desirable to a certain degree, but you don't want it to get too out of hand, which is why realistically you stretch tune a piano when you tune it well. You pitch down the low strings, you pitch up the high strings. A little bit of inharmonicity is okay, but you don't want it to get too out of hand so that if you're playing a very low note and a very high note, uh, that should be in unison. You don't want them to be so off that you get a really bad beating out of the harmonics from the low note trying to match up with the high note. And so uh, the video with stretch tuning demonstrates it. Um, I'm going to just draw something real quick here. So if this is my mid, my perfect, uh, perfect frequency line that I would have for notes as I went through, what you end up seeing is something that kind of looks like this shape-wise as you move through the keyboard. Um, and the amount that we're talking here is on the order of a few cents, which is not really that much um, in the big scheme of things. So we're only moving the, I, and I, if I remember right, the low actually pitches down more than the high pitches up. But this stretch tuning is meant to, to give you kind of the right amount of inharmonicity. So you're not getting too out of hand and don't end up with uh, a crazy amount of beats. I would say uh, it's probably better to watch the video to get a little bit 
better description on that, but uh, you can uh, definitely understand where this is coming from, just from the fact that real materials have stiffness and we have to accommodate that. So as I mentioned back here when I said there are over 200 strings, uh, what you have going on with a modern grand piano is that there are multiple strings for each note. Typically it's three, but the very lowest strings, uh, the very lowest notes may only have two instead of three. Um, now what's going on here, uh, you have three strings that are just very slightly out of tune. Um, I think typically they tune two in unison and then one slightly out of tune with the other when you're dealing with three strings. Um, the reason you want them to be out of tune is if they're perfectly in tune, what's going to happen is you get really effective coupling from the strings to the soundboard, but because they're so effectively coupled to the soundboard, you radiate all that energy away from the key, uh, from the hammer strike very quickly. So. It's loud, but it is going to disappear quickly. If the strings are badly out of tune, well, then you get really bad beating because if this one's at, say, 240 and it, the one next to it is at 250, that 10 hertz difference means you're going to hear a really kind of grating beat occur while those two strings are, are vibrating, um, especially as they kind of move in and out of phase with one another quickly. And so strings being strongly out of tune is not, is not ideal, mainly because it just sounds bad. This sounds good uh, when they're in tune, but the, uh, the sustain is not great. And so if you uh, just barely mistune the strings, you get the benefit of the sound not being uh, diminished quickly. And this has to do with something called sympathetic vibrations, which we're about to talk about. And the beats that you have between the two slightly mistuned sl strings are also um, really slow. And so it's going to add character to the tone, it adds some richness to it without being so distracting and bad sounding. So we have multiple strings. The decay time of the vibration is going to be equal to the energy to store, stored in the string vibrations divided by the power delivered to the soundboard. Um, so if we have three strings, they store three times as much energy. If they're perfectly in tune, that force that is delivered from your uh, from your string to the soundboard is three times larger. The velocity is also three times larger because those strings are in phase with one another. So you're delivering nine times more power, which means the sustain time is only one third of what it would be for one string by itself. So it's louder, but it's also diminishing much more quickly. You don't need to be able to do this number wise. You really just need to have an idea of what's going on with why we want these strings to be a little bit mistuned. Um, let me skip the pedal for a second. So if we have a little bit of mistuning, what is going to happen there is we still have three times the energy of one string. But if the strings are not perfectly in tune, the force is not going to be three times because the, the strings are not working together at all times anymore. Would it be increased from one single string? Yes, but it's not going to be increased by a factor of three. It might only be increased by a factor of, say, 1.5. Uh, the velocity, again, is also probably increased, but again, not by a factor of three. Um, and so let's just say 1.5 as well. So if both the force and the velocity are increased by 1.5, the power is increased by a factor of 2.25. Uh, 
Um, then three divided by 2.25 is greater than one, which is increasing your sustain time. And in actuality, I can't tell you exactly what the number is, but it's in the ballpark. Uh, it's more than one, but probably less. It's somewhere between one and two, more than likely, and probably closer to one than two. Uh, and what that means is you get a longer decay time off of these three strings being struck versus one. Uh, this doesn't even factor in the unicorda pedal that we're about to talk about. Um, though with the unicorda pedal, there's an actual extra kind of benefit to it. And that has to deal with sympathetic vibrations. Here, we're still striking all three strings dead on with the hammer, but with one of them being, at least one of them being slightly out of tune, you end up with all that longer decay time as a result. So when we look at a modern grand piano, there are three pedals on the, on the bottom of the piano. One, I'll actually come back to this. The middle pedal um, is the sustain pedal on most grand pianos. And what happens on the grand piano is that you play some notes, you hit the sustain pedal, and all the dampers that are up when you are pulled, when you press that middle pedal stay up. Um, what this is typically used for playing style wise is to play chords at the low end and keep those dampers up so you can keep coming back to that low chord and it it will sustain well as long as you have the pedal up. Um, I'll come back to uprights, but on uprights, that pedal often has different functions. One of the more common ones is to just pull up the dampers on the low pitch keys so that you can kind of simulate what's going on with the middle pedal on a grand piano, but not exactly in the same manner. Um, and there are different, different upright manufacturers will typically assign a different, not typically, will sometimes assign a different function to that middle pedal. Um, sorry, the right pedal, the one on the far right is the damper pedal. This pulls all the dampers up off the keyboard. So as long as you have that pressed down, um, in typically what happens with the key action, which I may have said this, but I may have forgotten as well. As soon as you let go of the key, the damper falls back onto the string. So if you play your keyboard with the right pedal pressed down, that pulls all the dampers up. And as you play, um, it doesn't matter when you let go of the key, the dampers are up off the string. So all the notes are, are going to sustain as long as the right pedal is held down. Now back to the unicorda pedal. Um, the unicorda pedal is the uh, the one on the far left and what the unicorda pedal does on a modern grand piano is it shifts the action over i think to the right slightly um in fact when you're watching one of the videos on on the pedals i think they actually physically show that um it might be on the pedals it might be actually in the steinway video too uh, that when you press that unicorda pedal, you can actually see the whole keyboard shift to the side. And what this is doing is it's moving the action so that the hammer only hits two out of the three strings. Um, and what this does is it slightly softens the sound because you're not hitting all three strings directly on. Um, but it also changes the tone, uh, of the timbre of, of, the, of the notes that you play with it. Because in the direct hit case, you're hitting all three at the same time. There's one, at least one string that's mistuned, but you're hitting all three at the same time. They're all being hit, they're all being driven into vibration. So they're all kind of dumping energy to the soundboard and 
it decays at the rate that it's going to decay. When you hit the unicorda pedal and you shift the string over and you're only hitting two out of the three, that mistuning is actually going to cause some of the energy from the vibrating strings to get transmitted to that string that isn't struck directly, but it doesn't do it right away. It's going to kind of move into phase, move out of phase, move into phase. Um, and so what you end up seeing is that you have, uh, you have uh, kind of more out of phase oscillations driven in, the, in that third string, which is going to add some richness to the tone. It also is going to diminish the loudness some. And so the una corda pedal is, it's kind of unique to the grand piano. Um, when we're talking about a upright piano, what is typically done with the left pedal, um, it's a soft pedal that just moves the action closer to the string. And so what ends up happening as a result is the hammer doesn't have enough, doesn't pick up as much speed. And so it strikes the strings more softly and it diminishes the loudness. A lot of times it's used for practicing so that you don't overwhelm your, your parents as you're practicing on the piano, you hold the soft pedal down and play that way. Um, some keyboards may also add an extra damper material in between, which also will change the tone instead of just making it softer. So um, left pedal is the unicorda pedal on a grand piano, and typically the soft pedal on a, on a upright. The middle pedal um, on the grand piano is the sustain pedal. It's called the sustenuto pedal um, on the grand piano, where it's only keeping up the dampers that were already up when you press the pedal. And then on uprights, it's typically a bass sustain. So the low end of the keyboard gets the dampers picked up, but the high end, the dampers stay down. And then the uh, right pedal is the damper pedal, and it pulls all of them up as a result. So before I stop, I'm gonna kind of circle back around to an upright and not just talking about the pedals, but a little bit about the construction. So on an upright piano, the strings actually lie vertically. So let me find my, my drawer here, set it down. Um, so the, the cabinet of a, uh, that's good. The cabinet of an upright, you have this part there that kind of sticks up, and then you have your keys here. Just blah, 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 your keys. And then the whole thing comes down with your pedals down here. Um, the strings are actually stretched in this uh, cabinet, oftentimes at an angle for the very uh, long strings, and then your short strings might be stretched across this way. Um, Construction-wise, it's kind of similar. There's no outside frame like the grand piano shape where I can't really draw it well. That's kind of like that. There's no outside wood frame that gives you that nice shape here. All the uh, all the Stress is still handled by a metal plate. There's still a cast iron plate in here holding all the strings and, and undergoing all the tension. But you don't have that nice shape to, uh, to it as you do with a grand piano. Now, the benefit is that an upright piano is much more compact and easy to put in a small room. Um, and your soundboard lies vertically as well. But Ultimately, it's, it's the same idea as what's going on in the grand piano. You're just fitting this all into a rectangular space instead of uh, basically designing the piano 
around the plate and the strings that you have uh, that you have for the for the modern grand piano. Um, your action actually lies vertically, and it will hit those strings. Um, and there's an extra coupling mechanism so that when you press down on a key here, it levers up, and then that pushes the hammers in toward the strings. So construction-wise, it's more compact, which is beneficial to space, you know, for space-saving reasons. Uh, Sound-wise, it's maybe not quite as uh, unique. Maybe that's not the right word. It's not as distinguishable as a uh, as a grand piano, but it's still very functionally similar. So it, you can get very similar sounds. The big difference comes from the fact that the pedal action is different on an upright piano versus a grand piano where you have unicordo, sustenuto, and then your damper pedal. Uh, typically on an upright, the most common configuration is soft pedal, uh, soft pedal, bass sustain, and then sustain. So um, I should write that real quick because I know it's in the homework. It's a word that's definitely in the chapter. Uh, sostenuto, I think it's S-O-S in something along those lines. It might be S-U-S. Sostenuto? Eh, I don't know. It's a, I think it's an Italian word. But basically, it's sustained. It's just instead of sustaining all keys, it only sustains the keys that are pressed when you uh, hit the pedal. I think it is a no. Sostenuto. Mm. I'm, I probably spelled it wrong. But uh, something along those lines, because I know it asks about it in the homework. The right pedal is not the sustenuto pedal. It's the middle pedal. So uh, that's it for four pianos. Um, this one is not on test three, which should be in two weeks, if I remember right. Uh, what I will probably do when I set up test three, I'll probably set it up on Monday, uh, set it to open on Monday and let it run through Sunday for, uh, I'll probably do Wednesday through Sunday. No, I'm not sure yet. Either Monday or Wednesday through Sunday. Um, with due dates coming up, I'm officially allowed to take stuff up until basically finals week starts. So Sunday night's kind of the official, you should have everything in by this day if you're going to turn it in. But honestly, so long as you get it in before uh, I'm turning in grades, which will likely be the Monday after finals week. Um, right now, the, the campuses are kind of tentatively scheduled to reopen on the 4th. And we're still not having class in person, even if the campuses reopen, but I'll be on campus at work in the lab, which means that I will probably, if we're working at, at the lab, I'll probably put that in first thing when I get in that Monday morning. So um, the sooner you get things in that you're wanting to turn in, the better, just because it will reduce my grading load. But honestly, I'm not going to be super strict about if you don't get this in by the Sunday before finals week, I'm not going to grade it. But the sooner you get your grade in, your things in as well, the better you'll know what you need going into the final grade wise. Um, I will probably, uh, at the same time I'm posting this, which will probably be tomorrow, which is Thursday, I will uh, activate that instrument assignment. I'm just gonna give you the quick rundown. So it's six questions 
five of which count. The first one is you pick an instrument. That's the one that doesn't count. So you tell me, uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the clarinet. Just picking one. First question that matters, what family does it belong to? So if I was doing clarinet, it would be the woodwind family. Uh, the five families that I have there are woodwind, uh, brass, string, keyboard, and percussion. Organ is kind of a gray area. If you're going to talk about organ, you could classify it as keyboard or uh, woodwind. It's functionally more of a woodwind than a keyboard instrument, but it's kind of a gray area. So um, just that one is you're automatically going to get the point, even if it's not right. But I mean, you're just look it up and see what member it's a family of. Uh, what family it's a member of. And then the remaining questions are, what is your vibration source? So on a clarinet, it's the vibrating reed. Um, if you're talking about a violin, it's the vibrating strings. If you're talking about uh, a flute, it's the, the edge tone, the white noise spectrum that you get because you're blowing over an edge things like that. That's all I'm looking for there is a very, you know, kind of short sentence. This is what's vibrating. Um, and this is where the, you know, where the vibrations come from. Then how are those vibrations enhanced so that it actually becomes audible? So if you're talking about a clarinet, the vibrations from the reed uh, get enhanced because of the standing wave that's created within the body of the clarinet. And so the vibrations will travel down to the end of the, the clarinet, they bounce back, and when they're of the proper frequency, then you get feedback and you get resonance and that creates the sound. The next one is, so that's uh, three of the five questions that count. Family, source of vibrations, how you get feedback, uh, I also added here if you're not if you're doing an instrument that's not acoustic, so say you picked electric guitar, you would have to tell me how you amplify the signal uh, from the electric guitar because you still have vibrating strings. The pickup is how you're going to get the you're going to get the vibrations, but you have to send that into an electric ampl amplifier to actually make the sound audible and drive a loudspeaker. So something along those lines, if it's not an acoustic instrument. Uh, the next one is how do you play different notes? So on a clarinet, you have the keys and you open, you open finger holes basically with the keys on the instrument. So I open a finger hole that effectively shortens the instrument. It gives me a higher pitch. That's how it plays different notes. And then the last one um, is uh, is there any way of tuning the instrument? So I don't really remember for clarinet, but um, maybe there is. But if you're talking about like a violin, you change the string tension to tune the instrument. If you're talking about um, a trumpet, there's a tuning slide so you can move that in or out to change the whole length of the trumpet so that you can tune the instrument. So those are your, those are all you're filling out is Family, source of vibrations, how you get feedback so that it's audible. Um, how do you play different notes and how do you tune it? And you just describe those in a sentence or two. If it's done and it looks reasonable, it's five points out of five points. And so that replaces the in-class quizzes um, if you don't do it, whatever you have now for the in-class quizzes, the three of them that we took before spring break, um, that will just count for that part of the grade. So if you've got an 80 right now, you would get four out of five points. If you do the, um, the exercise that I'm assigning, that's five out of five points. So it's an extra point on your grade for very minimal work because honestly, this is something that you can 
go and just like search for whatever instrument you're going to do and all that stuff is probably laid out for you to kind of summarize and, and feed back to me. Um, I'm honestly not going to spend too much time grading it. Like I said, this is more of a uh, an exercise so that you have to do something to get those five points on your class grade, but not, I don't want it to be anything too arduous because um, the situation is weird and I would rather um, essentially give the points away without just giving them away. So that's all that is. That will, uh, I'll put that in the module section um, probably at the same time I'm uploading the video page for this chapter. And it's really about it. Um, keep on the homework so that uh, you're getting that. And I'm thinking about a possible way to give you a kind of a replacement grade or two in the homework if you missed a, an assignment. But it'll probably be a little bit more involved than the uh, instrument assignment that I'm giving for the quizzes but not too much because I don't want to kill myself grading stuff. So um, I will uh, try to come up with something for that, but um, I also have plans to add an extra drop at, at some point. So if right now I think it's set up for two drops, I will probably drop a third homework grade. So that will probably help some of you as well. But I um, guess that's about it. A lot of this will go up as an announcement in Canvas too if you got tired of listening to me ramble on at the end of this video. So um, with that said, remember this is not on the next test. This is going to be on the final, but it's not going, not going to be on test three. Test three starts with temperament, which is kind of the most in my opinion, one of the more annoying chapters because it's hard to remember some of the the, the subtle details about that. Um, temperament, woodwinds, brass instruments, string family. That's what's on the next test. Final will add 13 and 14. <clears throat> um, in past, I put all the questions for 13 and 14 on there. And... I think I can still do that in um, in Canvas, but I'll have to come up with that. Otherwise, it will be 100 multiple choice questions at random from all the homework assignments. So um, final, the next test, test three is 50 still. I think there's ballpark, just a little bit more than 50 questions. So almost every question from the those four chapters of homework that are on the test will be on this next test. Just like the last one you took was like 50 out of 59. I think this one's even closer. I think it's like 50 out of 54. Um, and then the final will be 100 questions and it may skew heavier toward the chapter 13 and 14 if I can figure out how to make that happen. I don't plan to to uh, proctor directly through the honor lock thing. I was thinking about it for the final, but um, overall I would say the grades on, on, the, uh, on the second test were kind of, you know, ballpark where I expected them to be, aside from maybe one or two here or there, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary, so uh, test three and the final um, test three will probably be a little bit easier if you really wanted to to try to work your way around things but the final with all those questions and the time limit um, will be a little bit tougher because you'll have 100 questions and 120 minutes on the final whereas you're doing 50 and 75 for the uh, for the midterm tests anyway um that's about it so announcement will probably be up tomorrow or friday at the absolute latest uh with the assignment and all that 
also probably some details about test three and making the third study guide available and all that junk. So that will all be coming soon. And that's really all I have to say. So um, have a good day.